Hello, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a slight introduction to neural networks and how to implement them in Keras. Uh, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about DYC, Design Your Careers. Uh, DYC is a nonprofit organization and a, and a great platform that tries to showcase uh, everyone's talents, whether it's a, it's a middle schooler, high schooler, or even beyond in college by running um, educational, hands-on uh, workshops and activities, fundraisers and all that sorts of stuff. Um, and it, it's been really fruitful for me in my life as a way for teaching and for learning. And so I encourage you to check out uh, our website at designyourcareers.org or, or the about video here listed as well. Uh, we will link this in the YouTube description. Uh, this is me. Uh, I'm a second year computer science student at Berkeley. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking towards and specializing in data-driven algorithms, uh, learning things like machine learning, um, natural language processing, these kinds of things are, are my domains of interest. And as such, this, this sort of uh, uh, workshop is going to be about Keras, which is one of the uh, startup tools uh, for neural network creation. So let's talk about it. Let's get into Keras. So let's start with uh, the nitty gritty here, just to make sure we understand what's going on inside this world. The first thing you're, you're going to have to know is something called the neuron. Neurons are actually not things on the screen or inside computers. They're actually things in our brain. So there's a particular way in which our brain processes information. And this is how this computer science-y mathematical neuron was derived. We're not going to go into the biology of things because, frankly speaking, I'm not that great with biology. But this is actually fundamentally biologically motivated. And the interesting thing about this is that, well, all it is is just taking numbers, multiplying them with numbers, and then adding them up. That's all it is. So let's see if we can get a pointer here. All right. So the idea here is we have something called x1, just a number, x2, just a number, x3, just a number, and we assign weights to them. Well, when, once we assign weights to them, we want to pretend like we're doing a multiplication here. We carry out the multiplication, and then we have a sum of the um, multiplication with the, with the weights. This is called a linear combination of the inputs, uh, but that's not really that important. The idea here is I said this was sort of like a virtual multiplication because we don't know what W1, W2, and W3 are. We have our inputs, x1, x2, x3. For example, these could be you know, an image or uh, a text of some kind, whatever it is. And our output may be you know, just a number, like for example, how hard it was how hard it is to read the text or whether an image has a cat or a dog or whatever it may be. But this part is sort of hidden and that's why it's called the hidden layer. We don't know what W1, W2 and W3 are. It's our job to figure it out. And to do this, we're going to have to take a look at things called activation functions. We're going to have to take a look at things called, you know, convolutional layers, um, dense layers or fully connected layers, all these kinds of things. So let's take a closer look at what one of those things are. First thing is activation function. One thing you may have noticed here is that what we're doing is we're taking x3, our input, multiplying with a number, w3, which we don't know, and getting a bunch of, uh, a bunch of weights times a bunch of input numbers, and then summing them all up. Well, if you think back to something that you may have learned in the past, linear regression, this is actually linear regression. The reason is there are no nonlinearities associated here. And if you're kind of confused at this point, I would encourage you to go back and review some, some kind of uh, topics on linear regression and least squares just to make sure you're up to speed here. The idea here is that you don't want to just be using linearities here because we could just use least squares in that case. That's why we want to be able to apply activation functions. And what that does is it takes this sum and inside this hidden layer, after the sum is calculated, it applies a function to it. And this could be the sigmoid or the tan h or the relu. We're going to talk a lot about the ReLU because the ReLU is actually a very famous function. Or I shouldn't say famous. I should say it's more, it's more used than the others uh, by a dis decent amount, at least in neural networks. And let's actually talk about the, the ReLU. There's actually quite a few theoretical properties that it, that, that it satisfies and that, that it's really good at doing. Um, it takes the max of 0 and x. And if you take a look at the, the graph, it sort of looks like an elbow. It zeroes out all the negative values. Now, why might that actually be helpful? 
how is that even a nonlinearity, right? Because both parts of the function are linear. It's a piecewise linear function. But somehow the theoretical properties of this, um, uh, as it's related to the gradient and all those kinds of things, are really helpful for, for uh, neural networks and especially convolutional neural networks. Uh, other ones that we use quite often are tan H and sigmoid. Sigmoid is a uh, represent sort of a probability. Um, we tend to use this for classification tests where we want to generate a probabilistic distribution. Um, it gives us a number between zero and one. Uh, tan H is sort of similar, except it gives you a number between negative one and one. So this typically happens with um, regression tests where we want to find a number between zero, negative one and one, and we've normalized uh, in some way to between negative one and one. Um, but all these other ones, they're there. Uh, they're used for more specialized tasks. So leaky ReLU was used to solve the vanishing gradient problem in ReLU. We're not going to get into that, but but it's a thing to look out for if you get deeper and deeper into the subject. All right. So we talked about hidden layer. Let's talk about hidden layers, right? We can put a lot of these together to get a much, much more complex network. So remember that initially all we had was, whoops, just this one hidden layer where we had three weights pulling into this one sum and then the sum was passed to the output. Well, this is different. This is more stuff, right? We'll talk about why that may be good or bad later. But what we're doing here is we're taking W11 multiplying by X1, W12 multiplying by X1, W13 multiplying by X1, W14 multiplying by X1, so on and so forth. And we create sums for each one of these nodes. And then we do that again. So then we take this node, the sum, and then multiply it by another weight, and then another weight, and then another weight. And we multiply it by lots of weights. This can get tedious. You don't want to do this by hand. So that's why we have computers. We have algorithms to do this. We have optimization algorithms to do this. Well, let's think about this, though. We have these sums. Uh, we're passing them to other weights, and we're multiplying them. This is still linear. So we really need to be able to use our activation functions to make our neural net powerful. And this comes down to neural nets being something called a universal function approximation machine. Neural networks were designed uh, back, back in the day, almost 50, 60 years ago. And they have been used for something called function approximation for quite a while now. And their power comes from this right here. Not necessarily this, but this. Using a composition of these functions, activation functions here, and way more activation functions, we can create, we can uh, fit almost any function in the world, given, of course, that we have enough data and the data is not corrupted and all those kinds of things. So in, ideal, in, in an ideal world where we have tons of data, we can fit almost any function. Let's take a look at how we do this. So the real solution here is really complicated. So we're going to have to do some partial differentiation using an algorithm called gradient descent. And there's other sorts of more fancy optimization algorithms like, like Adam and RMS prop and all those kinds of things. That gets a little bit tedious, right? This, you get into this in a sort of uh, maybe an upper level college course or maybe even a graduate course. You don't want to take a look at this now. The easier solution here is Keras. Keras is a all-in-one neural network toy box, and it makes your life a lot easier. So let's take a problem. I've been explaining sort of in theory for a while now. Let's actually get into the nitty gritty. We talked about function approximation. Well, one function that we can take is the Pythagorean function, right? This is the, in other words, the distance function, um, <clears throat> if you're comparing distance from the origin, of course. Um, so we want to approximate square root of x squared plus y squared. Well, the first thing we want to think is, can we model this with linear regression? Something we already know. No, right? Because it's not linear in X and it's not linear in Y. If you think about it, though, if you create features, could you possibly do this? Well, no, right? Because if you create features for X squared, you still have a square root that's sort of bothering you. And so we need something stronger here. We can't just use features for uh, linear regression. And if you don't know uh, what I'm talking about, I would encourage you to, again, go back and uh, review basic uh, linear regression and uh, how that works in probably scikit-learn or something like that. So let's shift over the notebook for now, and let's take a look at how this works. <clears throat> 
All right. So let's take a look at um, how to actually use Keras to build a neural network here. So we're starting off with the example of the Pythagorean theorem here. This is a function of x1 and x2, could be x1, x and y, doesn't really matter, but it's approximating, we're trying to approximate this Pythagorean function here. And to do that, let's actually generate our Pythagorean uh, tuples here, generate some random numbers, multiplying by 10, um, generate your y's by taking the square root of the squares and summing them. Um, this part we're not gonna worry about for now, what this actually does is going to add random noise to our observations. And what that's going to do is make our machine learning job harder, but more realistic. Because in real life, we're going to have a lot of noise in our observations. And we want to be able to tackle that. We may come back to this later, uh, possibly in a future video. Um, then we want to do something called the train test split. The details of this are not important. But the idea is we want to tr train our machine learning model to be good on all kinds of training examples, not just the one that we show it. Right? If you read a particular book in English, you want to be able to read other books as well. That's the idea here. You want to just, you don't want to just have it be able to read, to read just one book. Um, and to do that, uh, we split this into a training set and a testing set. One, to, one set that we're going to train on and one that we're going to test on. So let's actually run this. Let's, let's um, import all our uh, libraries here. It's going to take a little bit. All right, so it's done. Took a little bit, but we're here. Um, let's go through this. Let's generate the X's and the Y's. That should be fairly quick. Now, here's something we want to make sure that something ha something. Sorry, we want to make sure that nothing is going wrong so that we don't mess up later in the, in the machine learning process. So we're going to actually put in an assert here, checking whether um, our, our X's and Y's are according to the function that we specified here. And that's just to make sure that we haven't screwed up somewhere along the way. And this is a good practice. Typically when we were working with toy data, we don't wanna be surprised in the end when we screw up. So uh, better to check. All right, so here we go. Let's actually construct uh, our first Keras model. The first thing we wanna do is, well, how do we do it? It's actually pretty simple. Once you've imported sequential from the Keras.models um, uh, module, all you have to do is set up a model by calling the sequential class. This will pass you back an object. Currently, it's just default stuff in there. Let's actually start building our model. The model creation process is actually quite simple again. Um, all we have to do is add layers that we want to add. Um, and let's actually get into the first layer here. The first layer is going to be something called a dense layer. What is a dense layer? Well, the dense layer is our fully connected layer. It's the layer that we saw before, where there are arrows pointing to every other node in the next layer. And if you're unfamiliar with um, exactly what I'm talking about in the neural net terms, uh, I would encourage you to go back and read um, some of the um, some basic tutorials on what neural networks are, uh, if you need a refresher. But the dense uh, layer models the fully connected layer. And the idea here is all we want to do is specify the number of units, which is essentially the number of nodes, um, the activation function, which is essentially the key to the neural network, which allows it to um, embody all these function approximation, have all these function approximation guarantees, and an input shape. What's the input shape here? Well, the input shape is the shape 
of the x's that we're passing in. In this case, the x's have a shape of two, right? Uh, so this should actually be a tuple um, like this. So the input shape is going to be a one dimensional input with two entries. So it's going to be two comma, and that's the tuple. Um, oops, we forgot to close a parenthesis here. Um, so that's our first. Uh, that's our first layer. Why do we include an input shape? Well, there's two options here. This is the option we're going to cover, where in the first layer, you always specify the input shape for Kara so it can deal with the math of um, how to compute the, 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 partial, the partial derivatives and all those kinds of things and all the shapes um, that it needs to allocate for memory and all those kinds of things. So the first layer always needs to have an input shape unless uh, you want to add a input layer to begin with. But we won't go into that uh, for now. All right, so let's add a couple more layers. Um, we want to approximate the um, Pythagorean function. So what kind of activation functions could be useful? Well, we have the ReLU. ReLU is sort of like an elbow function. It flattens out all the negative inputs and keeps all the non-negative inputs. But that's not really going to introduce this sort of curved nature that's going to be in the Pythagorean theorem because you're going to have a square root and squares. Um, so maybe we want to try a tan h. Why not? Let's try it out. Uh, maybe we also want to try a exponential um, activation because why not? A lot of machine learning is about experimenting and trying out new things, unless of course you're an, a theoretical machine learning expert. But I assume uh, that we're not. So let's just mesh on and see what happens. Now, here is something that's important again. Um, these are all our hidden layers. We don't know any of these. But this part at the end has to be our output layer. And what that means is we're going to output just one number, which is this y. right? The output shape is just one. So we're going to output one node. Um, point all the arrows to that particular node and apply an activation here. Let's do exponential, all right? And then one thing that's really useful in Keras is you can print out a full summary of your model. So let's do that. So we've initialized, added a bunch of layers, added our final output layer, and we can take a look. So this is our input layer. Our input layer has six parameters, our um, second and third, uh, and fourth layers are all, or sorry, our second and third layers are hidden layers. Um, and then our final layer is going to be our output layer. Notice that the middle layers typically have the most parameters, typically. This could change, of course. Um, uh, so our total parameters that we have to train is 157. So if we did this out by hand, we'd have to calculate 157 parameters at each step and do gradient descent on that. That's kind of hard. Um, Keras did that automatically for us. And Keras can train millions and millions of parameters. So uh, that's why we use Keras. Uh, let's take a look. Let's actually train and test this model. Again, training is actually pretty simple. Uh, all we have to do is specify a loss, specify the number of epochs, and we're all good to go. We'll talk about what those are very soon. But let's specify a certain number of epochs. What's an epoch? Well, an epoch is just how many times we want to go over the data to understand the data. It's sort of almost, if you think about it, how many times do I have to read a book to fully understand it? Or how many times do I have to read through Shakespeare to fully understand it? Um, that's an epoch. The more it is, the more times you're going to look through the data. Now let's talk about trade-offs. If you don't look at the data enough, you don't really know what's in the data. If you look at the data too much, then you're like, then you sort of memorize the data and you don't really understand the patterns, you just understand the exact data. So we want to keep this at a moderate, at a moderation. And we'll talk about um, how to solve that issue of looking at the data too much or not enough soon. Um, and for the last, we're going to want uh, MSE, which is mean squared error, which is essentially the output minus um, the, actual, the actual predicted value. Uh, you subtract them and then you square them. That's the mean squared loss. All right, so let's take a look here. First thing you want to do is train. But to train, we want to have to compile the model. So if you studied any computer science here, um, 
com- compilation is going to be somewhat um, familiar to. But if you haven't, the idea of comp- compiling a model is to specify what parameters it really has. So in this case, um, we want to specify the loss and the optimizer. What is an optimizer? Well, for the purposes of this sort of tutorial, we don't really need to understand what the optimizers are, as long as we know that they are there. This is going to help us essentially find our solution. Atom is a an algorithm, a very fancy algorithm that's going to design that's been designed to solve these kinds of neural network problems. That's all we really need to know. And we're optimizing for the mean squared loss. We want to make that as low as possible. So once we've compiled here, all we have to do is fit. That's it. So we want to fit to X train and Y train, and we want to uh, have five epochs here. So let's take a look and hope this works. There we go. So we started with a loss for on five. We're down to 0.33. We're staying around 0.33. I think it's become stable there. All right. Now let's talk about this. Stagnating. What could that mean? What, would you, what might you need to do? Um, well, it could mean a lot of things. It could mean that the function is just not able to be fully approximated with the density that you have uh, of, of units in your ne neural network or the depth or the activation functions. So we could make quite a few improvements and we'll talk about what those could be. Here we'll, we'll try and do some prediction and find our prediction errors here for our training and testing. How we do that is we predict values for the test set x test. We can predict values for our training using the predict function for our x train. And then all we have to do is just print training error um, by calling our MSE function, or you can import one from NumPy or uh, your favorite machine learning library. There's probably one in TensorFlow as well. Um, uh, that you can use. But for now, we can just write our own. It's just a line. All right, let's see if this works out. So if everything goes well, our training and test error should be around 0.3, and it is. So this is a, we've done a good job here, because if our training and test error are fairly similar, then that means our model generalizes well. That means our model hasn't overread the book, and it hasn't underread the book. It's done just right. And let's take a look at our predictions compared to the actual uh, real output. So here are our predictions, 6.8. Output is actually 6.9. 2, 1.9. 7, 6.55. So it's generally pretty close. How could we do better? Well, let's take a look back in, uh, uh, in the PowerPoint, and we'll explore that. All right. So. Let's quickly review before we go into our potential improvements here. Um, this is a summary of what we've done so far. We've created our model. We've added our input layers and our hidden layers and the output layer. All of these have very important activation functions. This is essentially what gives our model the power to do more than linear regression. And um, we've got some parameters here that like the input shape and the units that help specify the properties of our neural network. Then, um, we compile and fit our model. Here we've used a different optimization optimizer called stochastic gradient descent. This is typically not used all that much anymore because stochastic gradient descent is a bit, um, bit more vulnerable to outliers in the data and jumping around in the optimization process. Um, so we typically use Adam um, and then we fit the model as we talked before. Here are a list of some optimizers you, you may want to use. Typically, we use Atom, but there are other, uh, other optimizers as well. Here are some potential losses you could use. Mean squared error, mean absolute error. Um, these are used typically for regression tasks. Binary CE and categorical CE refer to binary cross entropy and categorical cross entropy. Those are used for, used for uh, classification tasks. All right, and then we trained our model. Let's take a look at observations. Well, all of these things require quite a bit of training data. And the reason we weren't doing as well as we may have wanted is because we don't have enough training data to actually read through and um, observe all the patterns in our training data. And we also wanted to have 
activation functions, epochs, batch sizes, all those fancy things, and we didn't really know how to decide them. Well, to do that, we're going to have to think about something called hyperparameter optimization. And to do that, we're going to have to do validation, and that requires a whole um, the whole topic of um, the test uh, training and validation split. We're not going to do that here, but it's important to think about. Um, all right, so here are some potential improvements that we could do based on those observations. Well, validation splits give us a way to calculate validation error at each epoch. What that tells us is that, well, how well are we doing without looking at the test set? This is something that you should explore a little bit on your own, and it's not really relevant to Keras itself, uh, but it could be an improvement that lets us see whether we're doing well with our model. Here is an optimization um, technique that does typically better than SGD. So in this case, we actually did use end up using Atom because I think SGD didn't uh, converge very well. But we typically want to use Atom instead of SGD. Um, another potential improvement is using the GPU. Uh, nowadays, um, the GPU is much more efficient at doing um, doing things like matrix multiplication or convolutions. So um, we're going to want to use uh, our GPU with these kinds of tasks. Um, all right. Well, now we've done things like predicting uh, Pythagorean theorem and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Let's talk about classification. So if you're not familiar with classification, to put it lightly, it's basically predicting one of a few classes. And what do, you, what do I mean by classes? Well, cats and dogs is a class, right? So if you have... Uh, if you're predicting whether something is a cat or is a dog, it's either a cat or a dog. It's almost a binary choice, right? Um, or it's not almost, it is a binary choice. Um, you want to be able to choose between a couple of things, and that's what classification helps you do. It helps you classify what things are or what things you think they are. Um, so this is a fancy equation. It's essentially just outputting a probability distribution of, of, um, of numbers that's going to help you decide um, what uh, class something could be. And the, the, the mathematical details are, aren't as important, but the properties are that this outputs numbers between 0 and 1, and it's going to give you um, vectors, or basically a bunch of numbers that tell you the probability that it's in that class. So for example, let's assume that the 0.1 corresponds to cat, 0.8 corresponds to dog, 0 0.05 corresponds to frog, and 0 0.05 again corresponds to, I don't know, giraffe. Right, so the probability that it thinks that it is a um, dog is 0.8, so it's probably a dog. If you wanted to choose the most probable animal in this case, it's probably going to be a dog. So we want to use this sort of um, activation function in our in our neural network to try and generate these sorts of um, classification techniques. Now let's do that. Um, uh, and by the way. Um, to do that, we have to use something called one-hot encoding, which I encourage you guys to take a look at, um, where you place a one where we have true output, which essentially means that the probability that it is that is one in our output um, by specifying it. All right. So this leads into something called image classification. And you've probably seen this. This is, what, this is something like what your phone would do if you have it uh, set to recognize your face. What it does is it takes a bunch of pixels, it turns it into a row of, of numbers. And well, if we actually use our typical uh, uh, fully connected network, our dense network that we created a couple of moments ago, things aren't going to be that great. The reason is, well, let's think about this in terms of two perspectives. We have a camera that gives out almost, that, that takes pictures with almost a million pixels. And so if we have a couple of layers, that's slowly, that's quickly going to become billions and billions of parameters. That's a little bit too much because we want to be able to recognize faces and all those kinds of things fairly quickly. So what do we want to do? Well, another issue is what if we shift something or rotate something or uh, mess around with something in a way that moves around the numbers in this flattened vector? Things aren't going to be so great. So we need a new technique here. This is where we come into convolutional neural networks, which are a very, very powerful way to um, uh, classify images or do regression with spatial inputs or spatial outputs. 
Here is the convolution operation. It's a fancy way of saying pairwise multiplication and summing. This is pretty much almost the same thing as something you've seen a couple of slides ago, except this time it's spatial. And it's going to use the convolution operator, which what that says is it's going to take and match up each pixel in our input and our convolution um, uh, convolution matrix. This is a special matrix that has essentially a feature that we want to extract. We multiply them and then add them and put them into this little box here. This may seem a little bit confusing and complicated. I would encourage you to go and uh, take a look and review what the convolution operator does. But all we need to know for the purposes of this, this class is um, that it is very good to use with images. And we can sort of put all these together uh, into a very deep network. And now we can recognize things like dogs, cats, boats, and birds with a specific amount of probability, right? So this is 94% chance that this is a boat, or at least according to our network. But there's a word we don't recognize yet, and that's pooling. What does pooling do? Well, pooling actually takes our input and makes it smaller. Why would we ever want to make things smaller? Well, we would want to make things smaller because it helps us recognize particular things. Suppose we had a really huge image, like those um, where's Waldo kind of types of things. It's hard to see Waldo, right? So what we want to do is make the image smaller. And if we can make the image smaller and Waldo bigger or keep Waldo the same size, eventually we'll be able to see, see Waldo. That's the idea with pooling. Our important features, our important spatial features, the things we really care about inside the 2D space are going to become more amplified if we use pooling. So we don't have to know the specifics, but essentially what it does is it either uh, takes, uh, let's skip this for now. Um, it essentially takes um, a bunch of space and either takes the maximum or the average or um, the minimum or whatever it may be uh, and puts it through the next layer. And this, ex this particular max uh, maximum maximization is called max pooling, which is what we're gonna typically use. Uh, we'll talk about that more when we get to the notebook. All right, here's another example of a example model that we could use, which is very similar to the previous one. Um, we use convolution, then we pool, then we use convolution, then we pool. Then we use something special. We use a fully connected layer. Why would we do that? Well, we'll take a look in the, in the coding section, but essentially the idea is if we want to classify things, we can't classify things based on images. We need some probabilities. And to have probabilities, we need a bunch of numbers. And a bunch of numbers that sum to one usually only comes about when you use a fully connected layers and a softmax uh, activation function. So we'll take a look at that very soon. All right. So let's go to the notebook now. All right. So let's take a look at a data set called the MNIST data set. This data set is really famous. It's actually probably the birth of um, convolutional neural networks. Uh, it was used in a very famous uh, neural network made, I think in the 80s or 90s called the Lacoon network, named after the guy who made it. Um, so let's take a look at the MNIST data set here. Hopefully it loads, there we go. It's essentially that just um, a bunch of handwritten um, digits. So let's take a look at a couple more. Four here, one here. That's a one again. It's a bit slanted, which is a bit strange. But typically, when you want to train a good network, it has to be vul uh, it has to be not vul vulnerable to variations in rotation or translation. So we have a bunch of observations of uh, training data here. Training data being the actual digits that uh, were observed. And we want to train a network that figures out which one it is. Well, let's do that. To do that, we're going to have to pre-process the data similar to what I said before. This is called the one-hot one encoding procedure, where we essentially take ones and twos and threes and put them into classes. Just like I said before with the um, uh, classification techniques uh, on the slide. So once we do that, this part should be fairly um, uh, this part should be fairly used often with classification tasks. This should be something that um, 
isn't something you have to understand a whole lot. Um, uh, the one hot, one hot encoding procedure is something that's used very standardly. So take a look at it, but it shouldn't be very uh, important to understand this is my point. All right, so here's an example of a network that we've already created. This is a dense network. A dense network is a fully connected network, the types of networks that we've previously used, not a convolutional network, not a spatial network, a network that can uh, look at spatial data uh, at, a, uh, at, a, at a greater level. So we can use this kind of network. Let's do that. Um, and let's train this. It's taking a little bit longer than the Pythagorean example, but that's okay. But notice we've gone up to 97% accuracy, which is quite good, 98%. Um, and I think we're actually going to hit 99%. But we're using the wrong tool for the task. We're using the wrong knife to cut our vegetables. Um, let's actually try and use a convolutional neural network. And you'll notice that we'll hit 99% very quickly. So we can have a, a calculate our test loss and our test accuracy. Uh, our test accuracy was just under 98%, which is actually very good. Um, but that's just because um, the MNIST data set, the fingerprint data set is, uh, or sorry, not the fingerprint data set, the, uh, the handwriting data set is actually quite easy to work with. Um, well, we can do okay, but let's actually train a model that's more suited to the task of, of images or image processing or image um, recognition using the convolutional layer and the max pooling layer. What is max pooling? What max pooling does is it actually takes the input data and compresses it by taking the maximum value in each little grid point. And what that does is allows it, to, it allows us to get out spatial features that are the most important. So it takes the biggest value and the biggest value is something that we consider to be the most important. Kind of a very weird way to look at things, but it works. Um, there's a lot of theory behind this, again, um, that if you're interested, you can look into. But um, for beginners, uh, it's typically something that we use all the time with convolutional uh, layers. So let's take a look here. We created our, our sequential model just like before. Um, we create our hidden layers. In this case, our hidden layers are going to be convolutional layers. So typically what we do is we put a convolutional layers a convolutional layer, maybe two, maybe three, followed by a pooling layer. And in this case, we're not going to worry about the dropout layers for now. Um, but we keep doing that until we feel that there's enough um, la there's enough layers to actually uh, understand the data. So we keep doing that. We keep adding pooling layers. We keep adding convolutional and then pooling. And eventually, we're going to do something called a flat. What that's going to do is actually take all the stuff that we have all the information that we're having in tensors and matrices and all those kinds of things and flatten them into a one row vector. Once we do that, we can um, use our normal dense layer to convert this into 10 numbers, 10 nodes, and then use a soft, mass, soft max activation that we talked about, talked about before. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Well, here's the shape that we start with. Um, we start with a, a shape of 22, 28 by 28. We apply a bunch of convolutional network, uh, convolutional layers. Then we use the max pooling layer to, sh the, to, to shade this in half by grabbing the most important features. We use convolutional layers again. We um, reduce it to half again using the max pooling layers, reduce it to half again. And at this point, we flatten it. We take all these numbers and flatten it into one row, and then we turn it into 10 numbers. What do these 10 numbers mean? Well, this is the one hot encoding procedure where we have 10 numbers that we could predict. And we want to have a probability distribution over those 10 numbers of which number is more likely to happen, to, uh, more likely for that particular example to be. OK, so the reason I have this code already written is because this can actually take up to 10 minutes to trick. And that's a stark difference to before where we only took around maybe 30 seconds to one minute to train. And the idea here is we have how many parameters? 200,000 parameters. It takes quite a while to train 200,000 parameters. 
And we can observe as it trains that the accuracy goes up very sharply initially. The loss goes down very sharply initially as well. But as it gets to around maybe 90% or 85%, it starts to slow down. And it's those extra maybe 0.02% or sorry, 0.02 or 2% that takes quite a while to, um, to go up. And so while we wait for this, let's go back and talk about some potential improvements or some um, bigger things that we could talk about with Keras. All right, let's keep going. All right, so some challenges. Well, computational resources are probably the biggest challenge and also the biggest boon of neural networks nowadays. We don't have a lot of computational uh, power in some instances, where, and we want to train very complex things. How would we go about that? Well, there's a lot of tools that are already existing and a lot of models that already exist that do half our job for us, and we want to use those. So we can use something called transfer learning, where we take a model that's already been trained, and we train it on our examples, but only add a little output layer at the end. And there's some there's a lot of science behind this, and this actually helps us uh, avoid training hundreds of thousands of parameters and only maybe train around 100 or 500 parameters or a little bit more. So transfer learning is something you want to take a look at if you want to have if you want to have very complex tasks but not necessarily all the resources you may need for that. Another issue is your data set may be hundreds of gigabytes in size. This happens quite often um, when you have huge data sets that you want to make predictions on or you're, you're dealing with a really hard task that needs a lot of data. Keras has data generators um, as Python generator functions that if you want to take a look at, you can. Um, the notebook that I uh, have attached to this has an example of those, uh, but we're not going to go over it in this 30-minute, uh, 45-minute workshop. Um, uh, the final hard challenge here is something called skipped layers or something that transforms our convolutional network from a, a linear convolutional network. And by linear, I don't mean linear in the inputs. I mean linear in the way that it's constructed. Let's go back here. Um, there we go. In this example, everything goes from one layer to the next layer and the next layer to the next layer. What if we wanted to skip from the first layer to the third layer? Well, that's what skipped layers allow, allows us to do. We're not going to go through skipped layers, but Keras has a way to do that as well using the functional model. That's also in the notebook. So take a look at these uh, all in the notebook. But let's go back and take a look at our, our training here. And so we're up to 93%. I'm going to come back for a bit, and we'll see what it gets up to. But eventually, it should be up to 93 95 97 all the way to 99%. And we'll meet up then. All right, so we're coming down to the model being fully trained, and we're up to an accuracy of about 0.986. <clears throat> Let's take a look at how our testing goes. So we're not going to talk about this just yet, but we'll come back to it. Um, let's actually evaluate our model. And to do that, we can actually use a function called evaluate, which where you pass in the x and the y, and it'll do the testing and the evaluation process both for you. And it'll print out the mean, the mean squared loss or whichever error function you specified. Take a look. Our test accuracy is now 99% on the dot exactly, almost. So our testing accuracy has improved, but this took a long time, by around maybe even more than a percent. But this took quite a while. Why? The number of parameters here are 300,000, and the number of parameters here are also around 300,000. Well, it turns out there's actually a big difference in, in the way that convolution is applied on a normal computer with a, a CPU. And that's why GPUs are super important for convolutional neural networks, because GPUs tend to do convolutions all the time. And they are optimized, well, they're more, much more optimized for doing convolutions than CPUs are. Um, there's lots of uh, cool um, architecture type uh, things you can read to understand why that's the case. But typically, the reason is that uh, CPUs are sequentially processed, whereas um, 
GPUs use something called uh, single input multiple, or sorry, single instruction multiple data, SIMD uh, type architectures where they take a bunch of inputs and do the same thing many times. And convolutions are an example of those kinds of op uh, operations. So in this notebook, we're not going to go through the rest of this, but we discussed generators and I've given you uh, an optional task here of improving the convolutional networks that we just had. Um, we had just around 99% accuracy here. I want you to try and get that up to 99.15%. It sounds very easy, but it's actually a, a bit difficult. Um, getting that last couple of 0.1s or 0.2s, it takes a quite, quite a bit of um, thinking and, and working around. Um, another potential task that we may want to take a look at is what's wrong with this model? Um, this is a convolutional neural network, and it's trying to approximate a function. Typically, convolutional networks aren't trying to approximate functions. They're trying to do classification or regression on images. But for the sake of this question, let's assume that it is. Well, in this case, what's wrong here? Take a look at this network and discover what's wrong. You're going to need some uh, information about generally how we do machine learning, uh, um, things like what we may want to take a look at inside the data, um, <clears throat> and something that we learned just a couple of minutes ago about what makes neural networks so powerful. And finally, oops, that's the answer. I'm not going to show you the answer. Um, uh, but yes, uh, um, take a look at that. Uh, there's quite a bit of information here in this notebook. That'll be helpful. Um, we'll additionally be releasing this um, um, PowerPoint and um, uh, some notes as well on how all of this stuff comes about. The notes are going to have a much more detailed view of neural networks, how they work, and um, how we can implement them in Keras uh, as well. Um, so thank you so much for attending this uh, workshop. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this taught you something. And uh, I hope to see you next time uh, at some other workshop. Uh, but, oh, but until then, I hope you have great success with Keras, as, as I have. In fact, I have a Keras model running right now, running as in training, um, for one of my projects. Um, the Keras model that I'm training right now has um, is temporal, temporally based. So uh, time is very important and time evolution. And so we're using LSTM layers in that one. Um, and I hope you go through um, Keras and take a look at it. Um, much more in depth, and this serves as a very brief introduction to neural networks in Keras. Thank you so much for attending, uh, and I will see you all later.